Let's head over to our Abuja studios and to talk really about Nigeria's worsening insecurity burden and also calls for the removal of the country's service chiefs with Mike Ejiofo, a former director of the State Security Service and chairman and chief executive officer of Apex uh, Safety and Security Consultants Limited, Abuja, Nigeria. Welcome to the program, sir. Good morning. Michael Joffo, good morning. Thank good you. morning. Good morning. Good to have you uh, again on the morning, morning show this year. Morning. Yes. Well, I mean, you listen to uh, Leila introducing the subject. Do you think that the removal of the service chiefs will solve the problem of uh, insecurity in the northeastern part of the country? Lawmakers have asked for their removal. Concerned citizens have said, look, uh, they, they don't seem to have the answer, even after rejigging security uh, architecture. Uh, other groups in Nigeria also insist that, look, the government should do something different so that uh, we can all be at peace, whatever the case may be, mandatory, kidnapping, terrorism, or insurgency. What do you think? Well, yeah, I'll look at it from two, two different views. Um, one is that uh, the service chiefs have tried their best, but we can't continue to do the same thing and expect different results. So perhaps because of pressure from people asking for their removal, uh, maybe it's high time government did something about it to uh, effect some changes, possibly inject new blood. But on the other side, I tell you that our security architecture at its, as it is now, even if you change the service chiefs without changing the operating environment, we're not going to make any, it's not going to make any difference because they need to be properly equipped. And that's why I'm happy that the Senate is looking into the, the structure to see how the security architecture can be rejigged. Uh, if you bring in new people, yes, they might come in with new ideas, but if you don't have the necessary equipment, the necessary operating environment, the welfare of the staff, adequate training, technological decision is not going to make any difference. It's just a circle, that, a vicious circle that will, will just be running around. Speaking of vicious <laughs> cycles, um, this is how Operation Safe Corridor has been characterized by some people. This is the federal government's program for the radicalization and rehabilitation of ex-Boko Haram fighters. What are your thoughts on this? In view of the president's visit, to, uh, the v president's commiseration with the victims of banditry in Katsina, and his call that jungle justice should not be meted on any bandits that are captured, that those bandits should be handed over to the relevant security agencies. But when they are handed over, they eventually get released under this de-radicalization program. Now, is it actually possible for de-radicalization to occur in the first case when these ideologies are so deeply entrenched in somebody's mind? We saw what happened in the UK in December and in February in quick succession. Two former um, terrorism prisoners who were convicted of terrorist offenses, as soon as they were released, went on knife rampages and were stabbing people in the streets. What are your thoughts on Operation Safe Corridor? Well, if you ask me my view on this uh, Operation Safe Corridor or releasing the, 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 the radicalized people, uh, terrorists into the society. It's extremely premature. Uh, we are fighting uh, a war that we've not won. It's only when the war is won you can continue to talk of uh, the radicalized uh, like people. Now, we, if you release these same people, they go back into the society and begin to uh, the perpetrate crimes and atrocities on innocent citizens. And the number being considered for release as I, is quite huge. And the question should be, of all these people that are being reintegrated into the society, how many of them have been prosecuted? None has been prosecuted. And we continue to see people, uh, bandits. Today, police will uh, uh, arrest and parade 250, 1,000. These people are not prosecuted. Now you are saying they are being released to the society. That's very dangerous. Uh, if, we, if, if the war has come, we have made substantial progress in fighting the war. Then you can't 
can continue to talk of rehabilitating these people into the society. But for me, it's now it's very, very premature to release them back to the society because uh, you, you saw the video recently released by uh, Shekau abusing the president, abusing the chief of army staff, abusing everyone. That show that is important. And uh, we're talking of releasing people back to the society. It's quite dangerous on my part. Certainly it is, and it's a very valid fear for all of us to have right now. And you brought up the response that we saw recently from Shekau coming out and also giving certain conditions as well for the release of the Chibok girls. And this takes me back to the interview that Arise News had with the Chief of Army Staff last week, whereby he stated that we have defeated insurgency but not terrorism. What exactly is your take on this particular statement, considering... Shortly after that, a really fresh attack happened in Aono village by Maiduguri as well. And that was a great fear for a lot of people. Several citizens lost their lives. So what is your take on that? Terrorism versus insurgency. Have we really defeated insurgency? And are we just looking at a problem of terrorism right now? But we do have to go on a very quick commercial break, Mr. Mike Ajiofo. When we're back, we'll continue uh, discussing this. Do stay with us. Welcome back to The Morning Show here on Arise News. Mr. Mike Ejiofar, a former director of the State Security Service and also chairman and chief executive officer of Apex Safety and Security Consultants Limited, Abuja, Nigeria, is still here with us in our Abuja studios looking into the state of insecurity in Nigeria. Thanks for staying on the program with us, sir. Before we went on a break, I had posed a question to you about insecurity versus terrorism and the chief of army staff saying that we've defeated insurgency, or sorry, insurgency versus terrorism. We've defeated insurgency, but we haven't defeated to terrorism, that terrorism will always exist no matter what in different societies around the world for society's unique problems. What is your take on that? Considering, like Tundun said, we've repatriated 1,400 former Boko Haram members back into society. There was a fresh attack on Aono village, etc. With all of these things, what is your take on this insurgency versus terrorism argument that we're seeing? Well, um... <laughs> I'm at a loss to that answer from the chief of uh, army staff. But I think people should have asked for more clarifications. These are stages in this war of terror. Insurgency is a war, a stage in uh, terrorism. You say you defeated insurgency, the military is being attacked, police has been attacked. These are stages. And that terrorism and insurgency go hand in hand together. And I don't see how you defeat one and leave the other. It's a... Uh, uh, perhaps I, I, I don't, I'm at a loss. I can't understand it because, um, honestly speaking, we have not defeated any of them. You remember that uh, there was a time we say Boko Haram uh, has been technically defeated, degraded, and yet for years we are still fighting this. So we have not defeated either insurgency or terrorism because these people are still very potent and operating freely. Well, Michael Joffo, let me just uh, <clears throat> take us back to the point about Operation Safe Corridor. We have had uh, two perspectives. Uh, the first is uh, the report about uh, soldiers, the troops themselves, protesting that uh, it's not a good idea to de-radicalize any Boko Haram fighter, because when the Boko Haram uh, captures a Nigerian soldier, what they do, or any Nigerian at all, what they do is to kill. And I don't think it's a good idea. Uh, to de-radicalize and uh, imagine that, uh, you know, uh, Boko Haram radicals will repent. But the explanation that has been given by the military hierarchy is that these persons who have been de-radicalized were not persons who were arrested in the theater of war. <clears throat> and they are persons who have not been fully indoctrinated and who can still be uh, reformed. I don't know what you think of these two legs of the uh, explanation. But I would like to ask you about the proposed protest today, a 2,000-man march in Abuja, uh, demanding the removal of the uh, service chiefs. And the presidency saying, oh, this is PDP-inspired, and it's the PDP that is behind it. It's the PDP that is organizing people to embarrass the government, either in uh, Maiduguri or elsewhere. Should the approach to the war against terror be uh, a political approach, a partisan approach, what will you advise? Well, uh, every Nigerian citizen has a right to protest 
over certain issues that they are not happy with. I don't see how uh, we should politicize the issue of uh, this uh, security. I've always insisted that we should not politicize our security. Uh, whether it's sponsored by PDP, which I don't believe, uh, or any political group, what, we are, what they are demanding for is to even assist government. So I don't see why government should react negatively to it, asking people not to protest. The only thing, same thing the government can do is possibly, if you have, they have the intelligence that these people are going to protest, guide them, uh, be with them to ensure that they are not, it's, it's not hijacked, and uh, follow them through their protest and make sure it's peaceful. That's my, my idea. And they're coming to the issue of uh, getting uh, the people who were not arrested at the theater of war, getting them de-radicalized. Uh, this is neither here nor there. If you say people were arrested, they are not fully indoctrinated, what have you done sufficiently to ensure that they are de-radicalized? Or what have you done to, have you acquired any skill for them to go back to the society? Before These are issues. And uh, uh, people who are not, were not picked just on the street, whether they were picked at the theater of war or at the fringes, they are terrorists, and they must be treated as such. Uh, one of your people there did mention how these terrorists treat our soldiers when they are caught, but we should not go about trying to reciprocate or retaliate what they are doing, because that is primitive. Nigerian army, our military, is guided by standard operational procedures, which must be followed. But if you go and see what these terrorists are doing, even to see beheading people, the intention is to create fear, which is actually the objective of the terrorists and uh, whatever they are doing. I, I think uh, government should tread softly in releasing this, some of these uh, people, because none of them have even been successfully prosecuted. That's my point. And that is not to say that there are no people who are, who are directly involved, arrested at the theater of war, and nothing is done. And the people you say you, you pick from the fringes, you are now releasing. It, it, doesn't, it kills the morale of the fighting troops and doesn't encourage them to go ahead. Because these people have dependence. They are Nigerians sacrificing their life, and uh, you, are, you are treating with levity. It's very, very unfortunate and sad for me as a person. I'd like to read directly a quote from Onyema Nwachuku, spokesman of Defense Headquarters. And he said, about 800 ex-Boko Haram fighters who would have unleashed unimaginable terror on citizens have been admitted, out of which 287 of them have been successfully rehabilitated and reintegrated into society. So their physical location when they were arrested is immaterial. They have imbibed that same dangerous ideology. So that's just a comment to your point there. But my actual question relates to intelligence. Now, obviously, a military solution is absolutely crucial for, to quell an insurgency. But for the lingering terrorism that follows an insurgency, it needs to be a multi-pronged approach, which includes or features or should feature intelligence, especially since terrorism is a global issue. There's hardly a nation today that has not had a bitter taste of terrorism. Nigeria, unfortunately, is the third most terrorized country in the world. Now, in view of that and the importance of global cooperation with regards to terrorism, we now have that unfortunate United States ban of Nigerian immigrants looking to settle in the United States, with a claim from the United States that Nigerian intelligence sharing leaves a lot to be desired. What is your view on this and where we stand as Nigerians in this fight against terror? If other countries have shunned us for not sharing information and intelligence, that, does that mean that uh, one arm of a two-way street is being blocked? If we're not sharing, are we also getting enough intelligence? Uh, well, I'm not aware that uh, the United States took the action based on lack of sharing of intelligence. What all I, I discovered is lack of data 
especially with immigration. And I'm happy I appeared in one of the panels when I saw the Controller General of Immigration explaining what steps they have done. And the government has also taken the necessary steps to ensure that uh, with the United States, for instance, get the necessary cooperation they are asking of because it was even alleged. And that's why uh, the United States took some of the decisions that night people would take Nigerian passports, terrorists would acquire Nigerian passport and uh, migrate to the United States uh, because of our database. But uh, I was satisfied that uh, the Controller General of Immigration is doing things in the right direction to ensure that that information they require is shared. Uh, we, we, intelligence sharing, of course, you agree with me, is a, a very critical issue in uh, fighting this terrorism. I believe very strongly that we cannot win this war through military intervention alone. The major causes of the problems, like unemployment uh, and the likes, welfare of the people should be addressed. And when that is addressed, the war will be hard for. It should be a war of the mind, a psychological war, instead of concentrating on military intervention, which will not yield results, because we don't even have the capacity, to military capacity to, to fight this war. So government should take the initiative by ensuring that the major causes of discontent in the society is addressed. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mike Ejo, for, uh, for your insights and for always honoring our invitation. Thank you.